I will never forget what happened to me on this very street corner the first weekend of September 1971. I'd taken enough hallucinogenic drugs for 30 people, more than living up to my drug bear reputation, but this time I went too far. Walking home from the bus stop, I, I got disoriented just a few blocks away from my home and sat down right here at 1.30 in the morning. I, th I thought I was losing my mind. I felt like I'd died and gone to hell. But what happened next proves that truth is stranger than fiction. Join me on my journey from LSD to PhD. I more than lived up to my high school nicknames of Drug Bear and Iron Man, but this time I went too far. Even I couldn't handle the equivalent of one ounce of mescaline. So sitting here right at this corner, 1.30 in the morning, I thought it was over. And I started screaming at the top of my lungs, I'm burning in hell, I'm roasting in hell. And then to my shock, a friend of my parents came by walking his dog. I still remember thinking to myself, why is he walking his dog in hell? But when he walked away, I made a decision. I'm going to do like they do in the movies. I'm going to end it. The next car that comes by, I'm going to jump in front of it. A few minutes later, I heard a sound coming right from this corner. A car coming down. And I realized this is my moment. I saw the headlights came screeching around the corner. I jumped in front of the car. I threw my hands up, and it stopped just a few inches away from me. It was my parents. If it had been anybody else, I would have been dead. Well, what was I doing there anyway, stoned out of my mind? How did a nice Jewish boy like me get so messed up? Why was I thinking about hell? Well, let me go back to the beginning. I was born in New York City in 1955. My father was the senior lawyer in the New York Supreme Court. and He and my mom were as happily married as any couple I've ever known. And my upbringing was typical of New York conservative Jewish kids in those days. We moved to Long Island. I was almost seven years old. And like most of my friends, I just basically had fun, played sports, went to school, stayed out of trouble. But then something changed. And all began innocently enough. I started playing drums when I was eight years old. And I really got into it. I was taking private lessons. I'd even played on a studio album at the age of 15. But my favorite music was rock music. And after I was bar mitzvahed, right in the synagogue, 1968, I wanted to be in a rock band. And later that year, I saw the Jimi Hendrix experience at the New York Philharmonic. And man, I wanted to be like Jimi and his band. So when I was just 14 years old and someone offered me pot, I thought, I'm going to try getting high. But nothing happened when I smoked it. Now I was intrigued. I tried smoking hash, a harder drug. And still nothing happened. So I started using ups and downs and LSD and really getting into drugs. But I said, that's it. That's where I draw the line. I won't do anything harder than this. Problem is, we can deceive ourselves as easily as we can deceive other people. And I didn't realize that I was heading down a very slippery slope. Soon I started using speed. Then I started shooting speed. Of course, I was sure I would never put a needle in my arm. Then I discovered heroin and started shooting heroin, and I loved it. By the time I was 16, my grades started going down in school, and my life was just filled with drugs and rock music and rebellion. And my friends and I would do crazy things. We, we broke into some houses for fun. We, we broke into this very doctor's office and experimented with the drugs we found. We actually mainlined adrenaline. And we did something else that was crazy. Let me show you. We just had to push things to the limit. So on two occasions, my friends and I climbed to the top of that giant smokestack, I mean the really tall one, and smoked pot there just to do something wild. But hey, we were cool. We were doing our thing. One day we'd be famous rock stars. But God had other plans. My two best friends, like two sisters, whose uncle was a pastor and their dad had been praying for them for years, and the, the girls started going to this little church and they got drawn in. So my friends went to the church just to spend time with them, and they got drawn in and interested. The question is, what in the world would interest two totally non-religious, drug-using hippies? Look, there's no question we were messed up. I mean, we were shooting drugs into our veins. But for the most part, we were just having a good time, enjoying the latest buzz, getting high. And when you added drugs to rock music, listening to music, playing music, going to concerts, high, 
It brought you into a whole new world. And I lived for those concerts. I saw Janis Joplin. I saw Jim Morrison in The Doors. I saw Hendrix again. I went to the Fillmore East over and over. I saw The Who and Jefferson Airplane and Grateful Dead and Jethro Tull and Led Zeppelin and 10 years after it, all these different groups. But there was something else going on in addition to the drugs and the rock music. It seemed in those days, everybody was talking about spiritual things. Everybody was talking about life after death and ultimate reality. So we get high, we listen to music and play music, and we'd speculate. So when my friends started attending church services, something interesting happened. The people in this little church talked about God as if they knew him personally. They talked about supernatural experiences they had. And little by little, my friends started to get touched. My friends really started to change that I determined enough is enough. I'm going to pull them out of this silly religion. You see, they had been raised nominal Christian, but now they really believed in Jesus, and they were different. They didn't want to party with me anymore. So I made a determination. August of 71, I was 16 years old. I said, I'm going into this very church building. It used to be called the Springfield Assembly of God. That's where my friends were going, and I was going to mock this religion. Instead, I was confronted with genuine love. I mean, here I was with my long hair and hippie look and bad attitude, mean spirit, and these older people in suits and ties and dresses embraced me. And without me knowing it, some of them made a determination. From that day on, they were going to start praying for me. Now, if there's no God, prayer is just a meaningless exercise. I remember during my drug days attending a high holy day service at the synagogue with my parents. And I was reading the prayer book and all these praises to God. I said to myself, looks like God's on some kind of a big ego trip. To me, the thing was just a joke. And I lived a decadent, wicked life. You have to understand, when I first went to that church building, a young lady wrote down in her diary, Antichrist comes to church. I sinned every way I knew how to sin. I, I stole money from my own father. I betrayed my best friends. I did every drug I could possibly do from angel dust to cocaine. I shot LSD with no physical adverse effect on me at all. And the wild thing is, I never felt guilty for two solid years. And then these people started praying and something started to get under my skin. I started to feel like a wretch. I do drugs I used to do and try to go to sleep like I always did. And I couldn't. I stay up at night and I started to feel miserable. What are you doing to your parents? What are you doing to your friends? What kind of wretch are you? The Bible calls this conviction of sin. And that's what was happening to me. Have you ever been found out by God? Finally, on November 12, 1971, I agreed to go to another church service. Now, being a Jew in a church service, that was a little awkward, but that wasn't my biggest issue. My biggest issue was pride. I was not about to admit I was wrong. And then the second thing was my lifestyle. I loved the way I was living, despite the guilt I was feeling. And even if God was real and Jesus was the Savior, I was not about to change. I wanted to be a rock star. So at the end of that service, the pastor asked, is there anyone here that wants to receive Jesus? I didn't know what it meant. But I thought, you know, if I go up here, all these old people that are praying for me will really get a kick out of it because I'm such a notorious sinner. So I went up and he said, repeat this prayer. And as I said the words, something happened. It's like a light went on inside of me. And I realized, I actually believe this. I actually believe Jesus died for my sins. I think it's real. But I had a problem. I was not about to change. I just purchased a whole large quantity of cocaine that I was dealing and I was going to go home and shoot cocaine that night. I was determined. So I prayed a prayer. I actually prayed this. I said, God, when I go home tonight, if you don't want me to get high, when I shoot cocaine, don't let anything happen to me. I actually smoked angel dust and then shot cocaine and nothing happened. Got my attention. I thought, okay, this is serious. So for six weeks, I went back and forth back and forth. I'd get high one day, I'd go to church the next. Shoot heroin one day, go to church the next. And finally, December 17th, 1971, in that same little church building, I just got filled with the joy of God. I got a real revelation of how much God loved me. And I thought, how in the world can I be living the way I'm living? And right then and there, I said, that's it. I'm never putting a needle in my arm again. And from that day on, I was dramatically changed. Well, my parents were thrilled to see the change in my life. After all, they were so concerned with all the drugs I was doing. But then my dad said, okay, that's great.
but now you need to come back to Judaism. So he brought me to meet the local rabbi. I was only too happy to tell him about my faith. And then he said after a few months of dialogue, you need to meet some other Jews, more religious Jews. They're religious like you, except they're right. And he said, your problem is you don't know what real Judaism is because you weren't raised in traditional Judaism. So he brought me into Brooklyn to meet with some ultra-Orthodox Jews. They were of the Lubavitcher Hasidic sect, and some of the rabbis there specialized in dealing with young people just like me. I began to talk to these folks, and boy, they seemed serious, and they seemed spiritually oriented, and, and boy, I went in the synagogue, and I looked inside, and all the men with their long beards praying, I, I'd never seen anything like that. They certainly looked a whole lot more Jewish than I did going to a church. And then we sat down and talked, man, I threw scripture after scripture after scripture at them, but, but an answer for everything I said, and even though some of the arguments didn't seem that strong to me, I, I couldn't convince them of what I believed. And they sat there with the Hebrew Bibles open, and they'd been studying Hebrew since they were kids, and I couldn't even read it. I barely remembered the alphabet. I had to rely on an English translation, and they were polite, but they just kept saying to me, you know, those English translations are just absolutely terrible. Now I had a predicament. I knew that I had a real experience with God. I knew my faith in Jesus was real, but I knew I had to answer the objections that these rabbis were bringing me. So I made a determination. I was gonna find out for myself. I was gonna study Hebrew. I was gonna learn the biblical languages. I was gonna find out everything I could about traditional Judaism, and I was going to follow the truth no matter where it led. I had to. So how seriously did I take the objections of the rabbis? One day after meeting with them for a few more hours, I went home and prayed to God. I cried out, I said, God, if it's wrong for me as a Jew to believe in Jesus, then I'll abandon the faith no matter how foolish I look. But if Jesus is really our Messiah, I'm going to follow him, no matter how much rejection I experience from my own people. Look, I was willing to go against the grain for drugs and rock music. Surely I can go against the grain for God. You know, over the years, I've found something very interesting. People are so paralyzed by the opinions of others. They're so hypnotized by religious tradition. They never even stop to ask God if they're doing the right thing. They never even explore the possibility of Jesus could really be our Messiah after all. And as much as they criticize me, they haven't stopped and looked into their own hearts and their own lives. For me, I couldn't live like that. I was determined to get to the bottom of things. So I spent more time with the rabbis. I spent Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, with Lubavitch family just to get an insider's view, and I gave myself to study. I earned a bachelor's degree in Hebrew, and then I got a master's and PhD in Near Eastern languages and literature from New York University. I didn't want to have to rely on the dictionaries. I didn't want to have to just read what the commentary said. I wanted to read the original text for myself. And then I studied every possible rabbinic objection I could find. Look, if the truth is on our side, we've got nothing to fear. So I, I debated, I dialogued, I discussed things with, with rabbis and counter-missionaries and Jewish professors, as many public debates and dialogues as I could possibly have. In fact, I made it a policy before every debate to sign an agreement that the debate would be available in full, unedited form to the public. Let me say it again. We've got nothing whatsoever to hide. But after a while, something strange happened. The more I studied, the more I learned, the less debates I got. In fact. I went seven years without a single rabbi being willing to debate me. And you have to start to wonder, could it be that there's solid evidence for our faith? Could it be that the Hebrew scriptures actually point to Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah? Could it be that the rabbis are wrong? How do you answer it? All the different world religions and Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and everybody, and they all think they're right. But see, that's the whole proof that something's wrong because they can't all be right at the same time, especially when some of them say that they're the only true way to God. And as a Jew, you could say, well, look, I have Judaism, but what about the rest of the world? What about all the other peoples? Judaism, by design, is for the Jews. But Jesus, by design, is for everybody. No matter how far away you are from God, no matter how good or bad you've been, we all fall short, we all need mercy, we all need help. And that's the message about Jesus. That's the message of the gospel, which literally means good news. God's son took all of our sins and shortcomings and failures and died so that we could live. But you say, how can we be sure about it? Come on, all these other people, all these other opinions, how can we be so sure? That's the exact question these folks were asking. And the answer is simple. God can make you to know. 
God can make you know for sure. He can work in your life in such a way that there are no more questions, not just satisfying your mind, but in the very depths of your heart, you can come to an absolute conviction that he is true and that Jesus is the one and only way to the Father. So let me ask you this. Is it that hard to stop and ask God sincerely from your heart, show me the truth? God, show me the truth and I'll follow? Is it really so hard to do that? You ask, he'll respond, and you'll be amazed at what happens. I'm, I went too far. Even I couldn't handle the equivalent of one ounce of mescaline. So sitting here right at this corner, 1.30 in the morning, I thought it was over. And I started screaming at the top of my lungs, I'm burning in hell, I'm roasting in hell. And then to my shock, a friend of my parents came by walking his dog. I still remember thinking to myself, why is he walking his dog in hell? But when he walked away, I made a decision. I'm gonna do like they do in the movies. I'm gonna end it. The next car that comes by, I'm gonna jump in front of it. A few minutes later, I heard a sound coming right from this corner. A car coming down. And I realized this is my moment. I saw the headlights, came screeching around the corner. I jumped in front of the car. I threw my hand. I will never forget what happened to me on this very street corner the first weekend of September 1971. I'd taken enough hallucinogenic drugs for 30 people, more than living up to my drug bear reputation, but this time I went too far. Walking home from the bus stop, I, I got disoriented just a few blocks away from my home and sat down right here at 1.30 in the morning. I, th I thought I was losing my mind. I felt like I'd died and gone to hell. But what happened next? proves the truth is stranger than fiction. Join me on my journey from LSD to PhD. I more than lived up to my high school nicknames of Drug Bear and Iron Man, but this time it's up and it stopped just a few inches away from me. It was my parents. If it had been anybody else, I would have been dead. Well, what was I doing there anyway, stoned out of my mind? How did a nice Jewish boy like me get so messed up? Why was I thinking about hell? Well, let me go back to the beginning. I was born in New York City in 1955.